Well, uh, hello everyone, my name is Ram Frank Kapu, and I'm a fourth year PhD candidate at Cornell Tech, supervised by Professor Muniju. So thanks for Barry and Tommaso's introduction. So I will talk about what Barry talked about last slide, which is these two robots. So in the summer of 2022 and 2023, we deployed two trash barrel robots in New York City to study how people interact with everyday robotic objects in public spaces. So today, this talk will be less of a research talk, but more of the storytelling. I want to tell you the story behind how these robots came about, how we decided to deploy them, and all the things that goes as planned and unexpected. So first, let's just quickly tell you how, this is probably the most engineering side for my talk. Um, so we have two trash barrel robots that is made of a standard 54 gallon trash barrel on top of a hoverboard. And the story or the, the joke we talk about in the lab is that the trash bot is made out of trash because the hoverboard are recycled from eBay. So if you don't know what eBay is, it's basically Amazon for, for secondary, uh, secondhand products. So we bought this cheap hoverboard and we repurposed them in the bottom of this trash dolly and kind of just dress it up as a Roomba and put a robot on top of that. And we intentionally avoid all human-like features on the robot because our design philosophy is a robot's appearance should represent its affordance. It should tell, you, tell people what's, purpose, what's the purpose of the robot and how to use it. And uh, I think the, I'm going to quote, uh, title this morning is the best design is little design. So this robot has no voice interface or any display. It's just robot and we constrain the mode of interaction just to motion. So robot just drive around forward, backward, rotate in place. That's all it does. So first I want to show you a video from 10 years ago. I did not do this. This was before my time. I was in high school. But this was my advisor's first iteration of trash bot. Back then it was still a trash bearer on a Roomba. It's a literal Roomba. But this was deployed in uh, Stanford, at Stanford Cafe. So it's not open public, and there was only one robot back then. And then uh, 10 years later, we did a very similar deployment, but in a completely open public spaces without priming. We did not put up any flyers or prompts to tell people we're doing a study. So people just thought they are autonomous robots in public spaces, and they just interact with the future. And this time we kind of uh, improved the robot a little bit. So this time it's not Roomba, it's a hoverboard. So more power, more speed. So it's better for urban terrain because New York City is very bumpy. 
And also this time we have two robots, so it's a multi-agent robot interaction. In this study, we deployed two trash barrel robots to study how people interact with autonomous everyday objects in public space. Equipped with 360 cameras, our robots were powered by recycled hoverboards, and we made two robots to separate landfill and recycling. Our study area is constrained within the trapezium-shaped traffic island called Astro Place in Manhattan, New York City. The space is set up with several metal tables and chairs for public seating. We used a Wizard of Oz deployment method to elicit natural interaction behaviors from people who perceive our robots to be autonomous. It's great that we can observe some of the similar findings as we did 10 years ago across the continent. But as people in academics, we know that we don't really earn extra credits for doing the same thing again, right? So why do we do trash barrel robot one more time? The idea is actually we don't want to do it. So at the first place, in the, before we do the deployment, we actually uh, want to do chairs. So we actually built a fleet of robot chairs. And the idea was to replace all the chairs and tables in public spaces at Astro Place. So we actually built like seven chairs on the same platform on the hoverboard, and we brought them to the plaza. We talked to the plaza manager, said, okay, we're here as from Cornell, we want to replace your chairs and tables. They were like, that's kind of illegal because you can't have wheel, uh, furniture on wheels in public spaces. If someone falls, it will be a liability issue and someone had to pay for it. So we think I'm gonna pay for it. Cornell maybe, maybe don't want to pay for it. So they're like, do you have some other furniture you can automate, other robots? that is kind of safe, but also have some interesting interaction, but also benefit the city. So we kind of show, we have a lot of back and forth on conversation, and eventually we went back to the idea of trash barrel, because New York City, as you have, if you have ever been to New York City, it's very dirty, and people leave their trash on the table, even if the, the trash can is just like five meters away. So in conclusion, this is really a request from the city. So I think there are three key factors that leads us to uh, back to the trash barrel robot idea. The first is the robot provides a service. No matter what kind, it's a service. Second, it is safe. There is no physical contact. Apparently, that's what people in the city want because they want to make sure the robot they deploy in public space is safe. Last is kind of subtle, but it came out later in the interviews, is that the robot is more enabling instead of replacing. So we have janitor stuff on the side, cleaning the street. They also have their own trash barrels. So we want to replace their trash barrel, but not the janitors themselves. That's why we designed a robot 
to collect trash instead of picking up trash. Uh, so with that idea in mind, we deployed our robots uh, in at two locations so far. The idea is to launch this trash barrel in all the five boroughs. But so far, we have been to um, downtown Manhattan, which is Astor Place. You can, this is a similar picture you see from Barry Slides. And these two are my wizards. So this is Ray, this is Jorge. They're driving my robots. They just pretend to be a bystander. And then a year later, we also deployed the robots in downtown Brooklyn. So if you don't know, really know the history or the geometry of New York City, the downtown Manhattan is more touristy. A lot of people come to the place once in their life to interact with robots. And here in downtown Brooklyn, it's a more of a local neighborhood. People come to hang out in this plaza every day. So you'll see a lot of people uh, coming back to play with the robot on day to day basis. So in total, we collect about 25 hours of video footage from the onboard camera alone. So each camera, each robot has a 20, uh, 360 video uh, recording camera and within which we annotated about 800 human robot interaction in the context of trans trash transaction. And the last point I want to, I think is special about this data set is that after I identify someone used our robot, me personally or my, some of my interns will go chase a person after the interaction and ask them just some open questions of their opinions of this interaction. Uh, if you're interested in this data set, please feel free to scan the QR code. Uh, there's a GitHub link to uh, request the data set. So with this, data, with this data set, we collaborate with a lot of social scientists to have some insights into what are people thinking about this robot. And that, include, of course, include Professor Barry Brown, which I will talk about his study in a second. But here is one of my favorite quotes from a master's student last year who wrote her master's thesis on this data set. So Anna, uh, who is a master's student, said, usually the trash can is the means to an end. When you throw out trash, you didn't really think too much about the trash can. It's just the end of this interaction. But once you put technology into this furniture, into this robot, the robot becomes the, t the focus of interaction itself. So if you have the analogy with the hammer, it changed fr uh, from ready to hand to present at hand. People's focus kind of now focus on the trash and its interaction itself that people have never paid attention to. Pay attention to. So this leads to a natural research question is, how is this robot being deployed in public spaces, being perceived by the city, right? From different levels, as individual, as a city, as a, gov as a government, as a city. Uh, with this question in mind, we collaborate with uh, a bunch of social scientists, uh, recognizes my very handsome young man on the slide. Uh, so we also took different uh, perspectives, different lenses to analyze our data, because we have such a rich data of both interviews and videos. So first, let's take a look at uh, this data from an interaction level. This is Barry's work I'm presenting on behalf of Barry. And then later, let's delve into the mental space. Let's think about what people are thinking about, what is the sense-making process that they went through when they saw the robot in public spaces. Uh, this is Barry's work, Barry's slide, sort of. So, you know, Barry's focus is on interaction, and interaction is soft. And actually, Barry makes, makes this claim, that interaction is all you need, and we want to focus on the interaction where it happens, the context of interaction, without thinking too much about the mental states of the participants. So we, through collaboration with Barry, Barry identified a few patterns that is repeating over and over again in this data set. So the first pattern is this drive-by pattern, where the robot drove past by the person, and the person just interacts when the robot is within some uh, distance, and then that's it. It's a very brief interaction. And then there is the offer and release para pattern, where the, ro the person takes initiative and requests the survey of the robot. And then there is the other side, where the robot kind of takes initiative and pressure the person to give it trash. So here you have to see the robot kind of stopping on the person, and the person kind of unwillingly kind of give the trash to the robot. So in summary, Barry came up with this SSS paradigm to describe this emergent interaction in public spaces, which is, sorry, the slide is a bit uh, different, but it's spontaneous, simple, sequential, and systematic. The interactions are spontaneous because, if you recall, we don't have any flyers to prime participants. Participants, literally, or the, the use, Palazzo users, they were just there doing their daily tasks and then realized there's a robot and they decide to interact with the robot. The interactions are very simple because 
they either observe other people's action and decide to use them, or they can just easily understand and copy. And lastly, is, uh, third is sequential, because there is this turn-taking nature, as we talked about yesterday. There is all interaction kind of have this turn-taking um, nature built into it. And last but not least is systematic, because we can observe these patterns repeat itself over and over again. But then let's go deeper than that, because we not only have the video data, we also have some data from the interviews. I didn't interview anyone, because I'm just being myself. There are so many interactions happening. I tried my best to interview everyone, ask them open questions of, what do you think about the robot in public spaces? And what words come to your mind when you first saw this robot in public? And this work is uh, in collaboration with Professor Kirsten Fisher, um, where we perform analysis mostly on the interview, where we conducted affinity diagramming to analyze what kind of themes came out of this transcript of interviews. And then we also look at the videos, but mostly to support our claims made in the interview. So through the analysis, we came up with this list of themes. Uh, due to time constraint, I will not go into any one of them, but I want to show uh, examples for this two, the role theme and the interaction theme. So when I, when I first asked people, like, what do you think about the robot? It's a very open-ended question. But people's response is usually, oh, the concept is great. The idea is great. We think it's a reminder for recycling. No one really comment on the robot directly. They're trying to directly trying to guess or make assumptions of what's the story behind the robot. Why, why are you doing here? What are you doing here and why are you doing this robot here? And then they try to figure out what's the interaction. So the first question that they ask themselves is, is this robot moving is accidental or incidental? Because the trash barrel moving, and of course the first thing came in mind is, oh, it's the wind is blowing, someone is kicking it. It's definitely not moving by itself. But sooner or later they realize the robot is, it's a robot, it's moving by itself. The second question to ask himself is, is this robot pragmatic or is it imperative? Is the robot have its own agenda, stopping by every table to collect trash, or is it kind of passive and I have to wave and request a service? And based on the question in their mind, based on the answer to the question in their mind, people have different behaviors. That is what leads to them to oh, either request a service or wait until the, the robot to approach them. Um, so in summary, uh, trying to answer the, what are people trying to make sense of? As an engineer, uh, I think the question that concerns myself the most is sense-making of behavior, which is, what is the affordance of the robot? How do we use the robot? How do we make the robot more you know, user-friendly? That's what I think about in the lab. But why bring the robot to the public? I realize the first question people ask themselves is sense-making of the deployment, where they don't really care about how to use it in the first place. They care about the bigger picture. They are trying to map this specific instance of the robot they see to a bigger impact on society. And here is what I mean. So, oh, before I do that, there is one of my favorite quotes from my interview I just want to show you. Um, in, in fact, before I, I'm, I, I'm a truck driver, I drive across the country, but before I did, I swept up this very part. This, I worked on the street doing this. I wore uh, those blue uniforms and I pushed it. I pushed uh, that bucket. Yeah, okay, yeah. I did that for a year. So I got my CDL and went to work out there. I left another area where there was no work came here, and that was that they had that work here available for me. So I worked in in this area and in this park right here for a year. So seeing it is super cool to me. While I'm watching them, I'm watching them as he moves. I'm watching both of them as they're moving around, and I don't view them as garbage cans. Now it's also putting more, giving the people more focus. Look at what they're doing when they come by. They're actually throwing their garbage in there instead of leaving their garbage on the table. Right, that's the or point. Throw, and that's the point. And so it's working. That's so it. now they're, the awareness to, to that, and they're not just garbage cans anymore. Yeah. So they're asking you to help, and the people are actually doing it. Thank you. And this is a great... It's a great quote because, sorry, I won't talk about, comment on the video because uh, what the guy, we, Wendy and I call the guy like a philosopher by training of the city. The guy is basically describing how the robot create a new social norm around it, how the robot kind of push people to do recycling and basically describing the whole sense making process in his own words. But of course, deploying robots in public spaces will bring you a lot of surprises. This was the last day, um, this is a screenshot from my message to my advisor, Wendy. It was the last day of deployment in Brooklyn where a bunch of news, news agencies just pop up and start filming the robot. 
of course, we, we got contacted before, but we said, because this is a study, uh, is a reservoir study, we don't want to prime the participant. So we asked them to halt their publication or whatever until the last day. But on the last day, not only the, the agency that contacted us showed up, like basically everyone in that neighborhood showed up. Just start reporting us. So we found us on the news, right? There are people reporting us for different lenses. This is from um, Gothamist, the Gothamist, which is a local journal. And then we, oh, we even well, found ourselves on the local news. Earth, you know, guys, if you ever find yourself caught between the moon and New York City, okay. you <laughs> may. That happens all the time. <laughs> you will have a little help now from not littering so much in the Big Apple. Oh. Trash bots are a thing now. Several remote controlled trash bots are patrolling downtown Brooklyn. <laughs> People are taking to them very well so far. They're trash bins on hoverboards with 360-degree cameras. This can't yeah. be sustainable. Well, no, and there's, there's some human help there. So somebody has a well-paying job, an <laughs> operator, who directs them towards people oh. who are uh, littering in, uh, in Brooklyn. Wow. About 20-something, making crazy amounts of money, right? I think it right. like <laughs> <laughs> So pay attention to the word they're using, right? They're using the word patrolling, right? People are taking it very well. So where does that word come from? Where are researchers from universities that trash can moving around, why are people think it's patrolling the neighborhood? And then we found this, well, someone else found this link on TikTok and sent it to us. It's where, apparently we're TikTok famous, where someone else make a clip of our robot with their own caption. But they're claiming that Eric Adams is doing the most with the MIC sanitation budget. So if you don't know who Eric Adams is, uh, he is still the mayor of New York City. And uh, we're just very curious, why do they associate this with Eric Adams? And then, of course, this will kind of st uh, steer the <laughs> online discussion a little bit, because if you look at the, the comments under this video, you will say, oh, of course they will do this in the cleanest borough in, uh, in New York City, which is Manhattan, where they need it, need it the, mo the least. Why don't they send this to Bronx, which is the, the neighborhood that needs it the most? And also they say, oh, they spend money on this robot, but then, they are, uh, in, in, rather than spending the money on, uh, on the crime. So this discussion quickly become a discussion around equity, social justice. And now thinking back, trying to f figure out why this was the case. We realized that around the same time we're doing our deployment in New York City, the mayor, Eric Adams, actually deployed a fleet of robot cops in New York City. So this is a robot dog that he deployed in New York City, and this is a nice scope robot he deployed in the New York City subway. So tying this back to the idea of sense making, you realize people are really trying to perform sense making on different resources, on a wide spectrum, not only from ODC, but also the social context, the cultural background. So that's one side of the story, but what about the other side? As an engineer, I'm actually curious about what does a robot see of the modern city? They are being perceived by the people, but what do they see of the people? I will actually not talk too much about this because a lot of my papers are under Kai review right now, so. Uh, I'll skip that, but uh, this is the footage we took uh, when we were deploying the robot in Jackson High, Queens. If you don't Queens, Queens is a very, very culturally diverse neighborhood. It's also the hometown for Spider-Man, so that's Queens. You will see like there are so many chaotic things in, in New York City. If you can make robot navigate New York City, you can make it work everywhere on Earth. You have food stand, you have people, you have traffic, you have so many different things. But I want to make a claim that at the heart, of this deployment, it's still about people, it's still about interaction. So this is one of my favorite clip. I, I don't have time to anonymize it, that's why so I turned it back on white. And this is what doing this uh, field intervention study gets you. It gives you the data in the most naturalistic form. So this is a click from downtown Brooklyn. People just like this lady uh, treating a robot like their next door cousin and communicate with the robot and just assuming it understand. And at SASR uh, conference last month, my advisor made this analogy of, of robots to the concept of the, uh, uh, the urban flaneur, where uh, 
by, by Charles Baudelaire, he defined the perfect flaneur as some spectator of the city, doing sightseeing in the city, but also being a part of the city. And this quote kind of represents what I see as a perfect robot. So the robot, this quote is, um, to be away from home and yet feel oneself everywhere at home. To see the world, to be at the center of the world, and yet to remain hidden from the world. I think that's the perfect definition of a urban robot, uh, at least at this current stage. Um, do I still have some time? And, okay, so, oh, so I added this slide last night, as you can tell, the P is on the wrong, uh, wrong, wrong line. But because we have some uh, uh, discussion on language models yesterday, I just want to have this uh, slide here because I also did some work on language model very, very, very quickly. I just want to talk about how can foundations model help us with modeling this interaction. And specifically, I want to talk about using language models or vision language models to simulate human behaviors. Um, in the discussion yesterday, we have a lot of discussion around language models, but I think there is is fundamentally there are two layers to this problem. So when we use language models or vision language models to um, model or simulate human behaviors, we have an implicit first layer assumption, which is we are using our language to describe our problem. And only with language as input, we can do inference like using like, for example, ChatGPT. But this first layer is also not very important because we are basically using, we are kind of, denoising our data in a sense. So imagine before we are doing, we are annotating human behaviors. We are working in picture space. We have like skeletons, we have facial, uh, facial features. But once we map it to language space, usually the matrix for language embeddings are much smaller than images. And also in a way, it kind of condenses information in an image. So in an image, you have the background, you have the foreground, you have clothes, but those things are not things we care about. What we care about usually in terms of interaction is their body posture, what kind of context they're in and what kind of behavior they're doing. So if you use language to describe an image, so convert image into a caption, you're basically denoising your input signal and then you feed it to language model to, for inferencing. So taking this for example, uh, if I ask you which image on the right is more similar to this image on the left, naturally you will say, oh, the person, the people on the top. But this is actually a hard problem if you think from a traditional computer vision algorithm, because if you say, let's just do like the distance between their body points, the guy is waving his left hand, the, the lady is waving his right hand. So if you do this like a purely Euclidean distance, it's actually pretty far. But then if you just say, okay, GPT, give me the caption of what they're doing, and then you do a cosine similarity on the word embeddings, clearly the top one is just winning. So this is the idea behind my paper I just published last month, it's called Restory. Uh, I frame it as augmenting social human robot interaction data set. But what I really want to do is actually just to synthesize Barry Brown style and storyboard. So if you see this storyboard, you might see this familiar because uh, this is actually a screenshot from Professor Brown's paper uh, on our data set where he's trying to use this, data, this uh, storyboard to depict uh, the sequence of interaction between the, the guy, I call him Bob, and the robot. And my idea is what if I have Alice, who I just named her Alice. Remember this lady was the, from a different model, is from the offer and release model. And say, what if I want a storyboard of Alice interacting with my robot, but in the way that Bob does it? And with the example from a previous slide, it's pretty intuitive. So I just use a language model to caption every single image in the storyboard, and also every single frame in this video frame. And then for every image in the storyboard, I just find the image from the, uh, from the video stream that has the highest semantic similarity, and then I regroup them, and I have a st new storyboard of Alice interacting with the, the trash barrel in the Bob style. So I can, this is the algorithm in detail. So instead of just capturing once, I actually have two prompts. The first one, I just describe the posture, like what are they doing? Are they waving? Are they uh, facing me? Are, they, are their bodies facing me? And then the second one is more about the context. Is asking, is the person interacting with you? And if they are interacting, uh, how are they interacting? And then I just do a very uh, simple weighted similarity to compute the score of similarity. And of course, this one's a winner because the, the context and the gesture are more similar. So I can do this, I can replicate Bob's application, uh, the behavior in any style. I can also do the other way around where I can just do the um, offer and release model but with Bob's data. It's not perfect, but at least it's like a first attempt at simulating human behaviors. Um, so now I want to talk about my second attempt at uh, modeling human behavior with language models as inference model. 
uh, this is still very early on in research. Uh, my idea is to build a interaction simulation just using interaction data I collected in the field. So what I do is you can either call this fine tuning or in context learning, where I try to mimic um, uh, the ethnography style of the transcription or description of the turn-taking behavior in the file, in the, in the field. So I basically convert all the, the video interaction into text. And then I use the text to prompt my, uh, to give it as a context to my language model. And then every agent in my simulation has a language model agent behind it saying, given the context of what actually happened in the field, can you replicate it based on the current description in the scene? So here I have a scene description of the robot is approaching the robot, the, the person, and the person is not looking at the robot. And then the, my question, my prompt to the GPT is, what do you think the person should do next? Based on my transcription of the actual turn-taking behavior in the field. And then the robot said, okay, you should look at the robot because it's approaching you. And then the person is approaching. Um, so this um, idea is kind of also uh, taking inspiration from this oh, very, very early uh, psychology study where you don't really need that much to do storytelling. You just need movement or shapes. Interaction is all you need. Kind of emphasizing what Professor Brown was mentioning. You don't need verbal interaction. You don't need uh, this place. Just a simple movement of shapes can tell you a lot about uh, intention, about people's feelings. Or you can see there's an like angry triangle trying to protect the circle. So I, my, my dream is to build a simulation just like that too. So this is my attempt. I am not an artist. I'm an engineer. So this is the best I can do for graphic design. I apologize. But uh, the purple is a trash can, my robot. And then the green is a person. And the black square means he or she has trash. So that's, that's the best I can do. And um, the only action the person can do right now is like looking left and right and also waving at the robot to summon it. And uh, right now the robot is driving by myself. The, the, the person turned yellow and started waving and then I'm just like randomly driving the robot around and then you can see the person keep following it. And this is basically the simulation on the backlog. It's purely based on discussion, based on this dialogue. But the dialogue is only focusing on interaction. There is no modeling of the mental state at all. It's just based purely on the interaction. You can see the dialogue, oh, the person has trash, the person is active, the person sees the robot, the, robot is facing the, uh, the person is facing the robot, the robot is approaching. So it's just this turn-taking style transaction of the dialogue. And you can simulate behaviors beyond just one, uh, you, can, you can simulate behaviors of like multi-agent interaction. And this is pure emergent, right? You have one robot I drive around, and you will see later, um, two people waving at the robot at the same time. This is not pre-programmed, it's all randomized. And then me as robot just trying to, like, can only serve one person. And then the, the other person look away because now this person is, uh, the robot is serving this person. And again, all of this is just based on this dialogue. So, you know, right now there are different approaches of using language models to model human, to model interaction. So I think instead of model human directly, model human mental space directly, I think we should take a step back. And using language models power to generalize, to just model the interaction itself. Instead of modeling, you know, what people are thinking, how happy they are, we just focus on what happened previously. What's the last action so that my next action can be contingent upon the last one action and it makes it reasonable. That's all that matters. And with this, you can, of course, train your machine learning algorithms or your reinforcement learning of favorite algorithms. Um, but then I hope you, this transcript gives you a way to first make sense of the scenario, also verify whether the action makes sense. Uh, with that, this is my last slide, some key, uh, key takeaways. So for my early study, I think when the robot, well, we deploy robots in public spaces. The robot are interacting with the city, but in the meantime, they become a fabric of the city itself. And then second is from my sense, uh, sense making work is that when we design robots, we not only should think about its function, its affordances, but also we should think about how people will take it, how people, uh, when people go through their sense making process, is their design playing a part in it? So for sure, I don't want my robot to be perceived as Eric Adams' robot or spending the sanitation budget. But that's how people perceive it. So that's kind of on my, on my side. And then the last key point is, Interactions are all you need, quoting Professor Barry Brown again. 
And maybe financial model can, helpful, can be helpful in that regard. So with that, I want to thank all my collaborators and my sponsors, and uh, I'll answer questions later. Thank you.